Yeah, I think this notion of failure, again, sometimes the English language doesn't do justice to words. Failure should be learning. Yeah, did you did you fail? No, no, I learned. Oh, okay, no, I, have you ever failed at anything? No, no, I learned. I think we just got to change the narrative. If we said to someone, if someone said, look, I, I don't want to, you know, learn how to play a musical instrument because I don't want to fail, you know, well, you don't want to learn? No, no, I don't want to fail. Hang on. I, I'm not, that's what I'm asking you. You know, what do you want to learn? So I think, I think if we change the narrative around some of the words we use, then we have a different perspective and then we can go forward a lot faster. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Today's guest, when I say he possesses a wealth of knowledge, I'm not kidding around, impressive on all fronts, Paul's resilience mindset and moving forward to perform at the highest level is brilliant to hear. You don't need to be a football lover or even know what the AFL is to enjoy this chat. There's plenty of gems in this one. And to hear about the challenges, journey, and ultimately the resilience needed to perform at the highest level as both a player and a coach is incredibly fascinating to hear. Paul is also a leadership expert, and it's really wonderful to hear his learnings and how he's applied it to not only his career, but also life. Paul and his wife, Tammy, were also the pioneers of introducing meditation and mindfulness into the AFL system, which is really interesting to hear about. Paul also has a number of leadership ventures. Check them out in the episode notes. They're great. Okay, let's get into it. Paul Roos needs no introduction for the millions of Australians who follow AFL. A legendary career saw Paul achieve success as both a player and a coach. He's an ex-AFL player, ex-AFL premiership winning coach, as well as a captain, seven-time All-Australian, seven-time All-Australian MVP winner and founder and director at Performance by Design, as well as an author and media personality. He's achieved it all in the football world. He was inducted in the Swans Hall of Fame in 2011 and elevated to Bloods Champion in 2024. He played 269 games for Fitzroy and 87 for Sydney. He was a two-time All-Australian captain and has been inducted into the Australian Football Hall of Fame. He coached the Sydney Swans from 2002 to 2010 and led them to the AFL Premiership in 2005, as well as coached the Melbourne Football Club from 2014 to 2016. He's also the author of Here It Is. Paul's love for high-performance dialogue was instrumental to his coaching career at the Sydney Swans. His revolutionary approach to player feedback and recognition was pivotal in building the much-revered Bloods culture. Paul went on to become a successful coach at Sydney, guiding the Swans to the 2005 Premiership, their first in 72 seasons. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot and we chat about his playing career and being a professional sportsman, coaching, starting out semi-professionally, his passion of leadership, his new ventures, drive and passion, conflicts, attacks from the media and CEO, showing up, meditation and mindfulness, living in Hawaii, plus plenty more. Before we get into this epic chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, so check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out at 3.30 Melbourne Australian time with the full video of the podcast to be released the following day. Okay, cool. Thank you. Let's get into it. Well, we're talking about Hawaii, so maybe we'll get into it. I'm very jealous that you live in Hawaii. Why the move and what has it done for your soul? Yeah, so I married an American back in 1992. Um, And obviously with my career, it was not too much Australian rules, football in America. So uh, Tammy realised, you know, she would have to move to Australia. So we were there for 
obviously a long time and then we we're sort of holidaying she's from california we'd often try and find a spot to to the holiday so her family could come and hawaii became a, a really a go-to destination and then about 12 years ago we sort of bought a property here it was a perfect storm to be honest the dollar was above parity so for all those aussies traveling to america now i don't i don't you know, make you feel bad because it's about 67 cents it was a dollar five a dollar six dollar seven back then so oh. uh so that made it a bit easier to to buy a property here and then about sort of nearly three years ago now you know given her commitment to australia and the fact that i'd finished footy we decided to to come back oh very interesting so was it like a discussion i kind of get i won't talk too much about your wife but i'm very impressed with her by the way i checked out her website i'm into meditation and all that stuff but was it a conversation you kind of get the coaching and the football and the media and all of that stuff and then we'll go to america to kind of like balance or even it out what were those kind of conversations like yeah I, we'd always sort of talked about you know obviously she'd made a huge commitment to come here and missed out on a lot of things in in the us you know birthdays and christmas oh christmas we pretty much spent every christmas in america which was good oh. but you know weddings friends weddings funerals everything like that so and it was probably forced on us a little bit because of dan andrews and how poorly he managed uh victoria and so we ended up having to apply to get out so it probably forced us out about 12 months or maybe two years before we were going but we we're always going to go at some point um so we just made the decision to probably leave a little bit earlier than than what we'd anticipated well it worked out well because i'm sure in those three years you were probably living the high life having a great time while the rest of us are stuck here so i'm very i'm extra jealous of you and what is I know it's a very loaded question, but what, what is it like in Hawaii? It feels very relaxing. I've heard you in other podcasts. It just seems more peaceful, more you can kind of just be with yourself. And I think the biggest thing I've noticed is the weather drives so much of how you feel, particularly your eating habits. I think that's a really interesting thing. I, I even find now when I go back to Melbourne, and, and Melbourne's a you know, place I love. I spent 20 years in Sydney as well, but... I just notice I'm so much healthier when I'm in Hawaii, you know, and again, the weather often dictates that. There's not a day, and I don't want everyone to feel jealous <laughs> on the podcast, but there's literally not a day in Hawaii where I don't have a T-shirt and a pair of shorts on and I'm not doing some form of exercise. So what that allows you to do is mentally get into the day. I meditate at the start of the day, but mentally get into the day and then you're not, you're not sort of, comfort eating there's no comfort eating over here because you know you're out in the backyard even if you're sitting on your computer it's 28 degrees you know or you just walk down the beach to have a swim the beach is about wow. 30 meters away you know so i think that's the biggest difference is i mean as well as certain lifestyle but if i had to summarize the weather you know winter's 24 25 and summer's 28 29 like there's no there's no extremes here. it's perfect like every single day is perfect so i think it's i think it's just your general well-being your general health and your ability to to navigate things that we probably tend to take for granted you know in melbourne i might look out the window you know i've got a place um an apartment sort of near south yarra oh should i go in the tan and go for a walk no nah, it's raining it's wet it's windy mm. that never happens that literally uh -oh. i would never ever have one day where the weather has stopped me from exercising in Hawaii, not one. I regret asking you this question. You made me very, <laughs> um, very jealous. I often go to Broad Beach and I have noticed, I'm glad that you put it to words because my I eat so much better when I'm in Broad Beach. I go there a fair bit. Yeah, comfort eating, it's cold, it's raining. I have ice cream. I don't normally do that, but I've developed a bad yeah. habit. But when I'm in Broad Beach, I just want to walk. The sun's so nice, similar-ish weather. Yeah. I think you've uh, sold it to me. I think I need to leave Melbourne. That's that's what this podcast is going to be be about. I'm also really interested, you mentioned from the meditation side, and this is something that I've been doing religiously for probably close to 10 years. But you started well before I probably even knew what meditation was. How did you find out about it? And yeah, I've got a lot of questions. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so we found out through a course. So Tammy and I did a course together in Sydney probably over 20 years ago. I was over 20 years ago. Um, so Tammy was really starting to get into it. She's um, got a doctorate um, on parapsychic science. She did a dis dissertation on meditation. Um, so 
and also my, with my footy, we we done a lot of stuff on the the physical side of the game. Like I started playing in 1980, and yeah, you, you're going to improve your 4K time trial, your 3K time trial, your you know 2K minimally. Now that that improves your your weights, but there was never anything done above the shoulders really. So it was as much of that as an interest in okay. It's got to be something about it, you know. So I went and did the course, and ever since I've, I've sort of meditated pretty much every day for the last twenty plus years. And now to the point where I'm, you know, I don't force it on anyone, neither, neither does Tammy. But I'm just putting together a, an online leadership course um, that I'm doing with my son, and one of the modules will be on meditation because I believe, you know, we we talk about being present, we talk about remaining calm in business as leaders. You know, some of the some of the um, outcomes from being a meditator can help you as a leader. And people often say, do you think it helped you coaching the Swans and, and Melbourne? Absolutely, 100%. So I guess, you know, you start off doing it. It's interesting. You see some results yourself and then you become an advocate, you know, for the benefits of meditation. I think it's the only thing I preach in my life. They're like, uh, do you want a coffee? I'm like, you have to try this meditation thing. It is yeah, amazing. Right. I love it. It's been a massive game changer for me. I'm also very impressed because at that time, and you know, I'm stereotyping, a lot of people didn't really, there wasn't a really awareness around sitting with your emotions and that can be very scary. So huge kudos to you for one, not only looking into it, but actually pursuing it because it was kind of against the norm and not many men particularly would have the courage to do that. What made you actually want to stick with it and try it? Um, I'm pretty trusting, you know, so I think that's probably in my nature to say, well, look, because, you know, without getting too technical, some people stop because, oh, this hasn't happened or that hasn't happened. I think it's one of those things because in running and weights, as I said, you, you'll get a time, you know, you, and you, or you'll lift a certain figure. So, you know, your time might go down from 13 minutes to 12, you know, 49. So you see a, an incremental improvement. In meditation, there's a lot of trust involved, you know. So I think once you get that in your mind that this works and i realized that from day one after doing the course i didn't oh, wow. really, really know what was going to happen you know but i just trusted the practice and then i think what typically happens it's other people observe changes in you probably before you do mm-hmm. yeah I, I got people joke about you know the that um you know the guru you know of meditation and you know as a coach and and some yeah you know, some things like that you're always calm Ruzi, because of your meditation and but i think i always took it as a compliment because i believe there's no doubt Definitely. other people saw in me some changes you know as a coach which is a high pressure yeah you know, a massively high pressure job and then bringing it in we brought it in and to tammy's credit we brought in to the sydney swans no one was doing it back then i mean tammy's yeah. really the pioneer yeah, the pioneer of meditation in Australia, really, in sport, because no one was doing it back then. And and now I'd say most of the teams would be doing breathing exercises or some form of meditation or something. But Tammy was doing it in, you know, 2004, you know, 2003, 2004 with the Sydney Swans. So it's just a practice I've, I've got into a habit of doing. Um, I enjoy setting up my day doing it. Um, and it's really, as you said, just sitting with yourself for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes or however long you want to do it. Yeah, I could speak about it for ages and people have noticed I'm way more calm since when I first started and it really sets up my day. I've probably missed maybe a handful of meditations in the last under 10 years and people could probably notice. But also I want to talk about the courage side because when I first started, and I know it sounds very silly, I was almost embarrassed to tell people this many years ago. And even now some people like he meditates, like there's still a little bit of a stigma but in your time, there would have been way more of a stigma. So not only for you to do it, which we've discussed, but actually to introduce it to a sporting environment. That could be quite overwhelming or scary or, or you're like, nah, this works, let's just give it a go. What was kind of going on at the time? I think I was pretty lucky because by the time we sort of introduced it, so AFL had become fully professional in the mid-90s, whereas I reckon prior to that was would have probably been harder. You know, we did Pilates and people would joke about that or, you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, acupuncture and stuff like that. But I think when I when I introduced it, we generally have a high performing industry. Like we generally have really inquisitive players that want to get better. So it was probably a a better environment, as you said, that rather than me, yeah, you know, joining, you know, a men's club or doing it at work or something like that, and saying, guys, you want to do some meditation? Because then people would 
you know, I was a bit like you. People go, oh, meditation, what's that? And I remember saying to Tammy, how do we change the narrative around meditation? Yeah, because it, it needs to become more mainstream. Yeah, yeah what is, so, so all we talk about is, you know, spending, as you said, sitting with yourself, breathing, remaining calmer, being more present. And when you talk about it in those terms, people go, oh, okay, that makes sense. But for some reason, when you bring up meditation, it's like, oh, do you have to go to on a on a retreat and sit with, you know, flowing gown and, you know, do I have to braid my hair and do I have to go into a cave and all that sort of stuff? I think, thankfully, yeah, since 2003, the narrative's a lot different now. But I, I was really fortunate that I had a really inquisitive bunch of players that were really interested. And we didn't force it on any of the players. Um, and there's no... You know, coincident that the best players, Adam Goods, Jude Bolton, Craig Bolton, Brett Kirk, you know, they, et cetera, they were the ones that really took it up and and became the, the champions of the, the meditation cause. I'm very proud of you and your wife for, you know, being pioneers in that space. I've also studied kinesiology, which is, you know, oh. looking into one's emotions and the subconscious. And when I bring up, and I understand everyone's on you know, got different beliefs and whatever. But when you bring up emotions to people and, you know, looking deep within yourself and what's driving factors, uh, what driving, what drives you and your subconscious people, like, so I like that you've been able to, I know what, what springs to mind. Well, uh, kinesiology, I, I, I love it. I We went to a kinesiologist, um, gee, again, probably around the same time. Like I used, I've been to so many kinesiologists and cured some, you know, emotional issues. Um, I get alopecia every now and then. Um, which can sometimes be triggered by diet and things like that. Yeah. Um, kinesiology was fantastic. You know, like I, I'm a massive fan of kinesiology. You know, I'm very surprised to hear that because there's so many people have no idea what it is that I've stopped talking about it more recently because I've done over 250 podcasts. People like, oh, that that's nice. So I'm glad yeah. that we've got a supporter in you. But it's also, you know, going back to your career with the, you know, talking about emotional stuff or the emotional side, Footy would have been predominantly around, you know, you mentioned the physical. How can I improve my my weights and my running? Was there much discussion around the mental side, how to improve that, or was it kind of not spoken about? When I first started, to be honest, you just didn't have time. Like like when I first started back in 19, I think I was on the list in 81s, played the first game in 82. Like we had guys, we, everyone was full-time working or going to mm. school or going to college. So you had... Yeah, we started training at five o'clock in the afternoon. Some guys got there at quarter to five. You know, we train in the mornings pre-season at 6.30 at Kerford Road. So I think the mental side was more resilience. It was more, you know, train as hard as you possibly can. You might be injured, but play on the weekend. I think if, if you talk about the mental side back then, it was more just how much you could push yourself above the shoulders. You know, we would do 100, 100 metres, you know, 100, 100 meter sprints, like on a Saturday morning, you know, at nine o'clock. So I think when it was spoken about then, it was more just being physically, a, a, your physical ability to just push yourself beyond what your body thought you could do. As we got fully professional, as I said, in the mid 90s, and as we moved into, you know, 2000, won the premiership in 2005, yeah, I think the conversation was starting to happen then, you know. You know, how can we get better mentally? Sports psychologists became a lot more normalised within football clubs. Um, as I said, you know the 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 meditation and the breathing. You know, and then then you then you'd have yeah mainstream huge athletes come out and talk about yeah you know, their breathing or their meditation. So then it, then it just become more normalised. But certainly mm-hmm. when I first started, no, and, and largely because of time, really. You mentioned that you were like dabbling in at that stage you did the course or was it more for coaching i'm trying to figure out the timeline when did your yeah i I mean i did tammy because i'm getting old and you know forgetting things but i (laughs) I actually can't remember i think i I think i was still playing when we did the course but i certainly wasn't if it was it was more to the end end of the course so once i started coaching i became way more aware of the mental side and you know, changing the narrative even around leadership, you know, what do the players need, you know, things like positive feedback rather than negative feedback. You know, there was this notion of coach-player, that the coach can't be friends with a player. Oh, I always found that strange, you know. You'd, mm. Like, you didn't have to set out to be friends, but I've got some great friends that I coached. I still keep in contact with them. So even breaking down some certain stereotypes around coaches, which is more mental and uh, rather than physical. I've got a billion questions, but just on that, 
I heard you say something about how many weddings you'd be invited to. It slips my mind. Yeah, it was what- interesting. It was said to me. It was said to me once. Um, you, you should judge yourself as a leader as to how many weddings you get invited to. And I was like, that actually makes really good sense, you know, because this notion and leadership has changed enormously. I wrote down, yeah, you know, leadership manifesto at the end of nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, because it, it changed so much. And a lot of it revolved around relationships and positive feedback and all that in 98. But I always thought to myself, you know, leadership is about influence. Leadership is about bringing people along with you. Leadership. So it doesn't mean you have to be friends or you have to get invited to weddings. But I thought I thought it probably sums up this new, you know, new form of leadership is are you building strong relationships with your staff? And then when they have their wedding, you know, uh, you, you know, he might miss out, but do you just miss out? Or it's like, shit, I'm not going to invite Rusey. There's no way known he's coming. Yeah. No way known he's coming to my wedding because he's a pain in the ass. So I just thought it was a really interesting way to um, to look at leadership. I agree. It shows the respect as well, whether they're invited or not. But being in that conversation shows, you know, obviously a very, really deep connection because I've had managers I used to be in corporate space. And not that I wanted to be best friends with the managers or anything, but some of the managers I had, it was more like, I'm your manager, do the yeah. work. And I thought it was a horrific style of leadership, yeah. especially doing something you don't even like. And I know in yeah. 40, you know, people want to be there, but still there's motivation and all of that stuff that comes up. But having a manager where it's like, do your work for something you don't even really want to do was yeah. horrible. <laughs> and it was very interesting how you... Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll build context. You know, you mentioned at the end of 1998, you wrote that, you know, leadership manifesto. I want to, you know, paint the picture because this is quite magnificent and not many players would do this. I think it was nearing near the end of your playing career, you wrote down, was it 25 things, what you like and don't like in leaders? And that's kind of been a guiding light for you since? Yeah, 100%. So October 1998 is when I retired. I've still got the old scrappy piece of paper, which I printed off. And oh, nice. look, I, I didn't really know why I did it other than the leadership had changed. So it was more just to say, well, okay, if leadership has changed, have leaders changed with it? And if I do become a leader of a footy club, as in coach, and, I, and again, I didn't start coaching until four years later, um, can I hold myself accountable to the leader? And the other way I talk about it now is, are you the leader you wish you had, which is mm. a really interesting way to look at it. I love that. So I just sit down at my desk and wrote down, it happened to be 25 points, the things I liked about my leaders, things I didn't like about my leaders, and largely, as I said, it came back to lack of time. You know, so we started to become full-time only in the mid-90s. So prior to that, I mean, Robert Walls, David Parker, Walls, he was a school teacher, Parker was a lecturer. I mean, they, they didn't have time to be thinking about relationships and culture codes and leadership groups and all those sorts of things. But it was a it was definitely worthwhile doing. You know, I still, still talk about it now in the keynotes that I do and the workshops we do with Performance by Design, the online leadership course, that I've just put together, I've actually gone through each of the 25 points and explained, you know, what they are and why why I wrote them down. Um, so, yeah, I, it was it was super, super important because I wrote it down through the eyes of a player. And you mentioned before about, you know, your manager. This is the other thing. The leadership can be what do I want to give you or what do you need from me? Okay, two different things. As a leader, what do I want to give you? Or what do you need from me? So that list was written down, what what I needed from my leaders. So then all of a sudden, when I was coaching Sydney and coaching Melbourne, I could look back as Paul Roos, the player, and say, gee, I wanted positive feedback. You know, players don't mean to make mistakes. Um, you know, be specific at quarter time, half time, three quarter. Oh, right, okay, gee, I, I didn't do that well enough on the weekend. That's what I needed as a player. That's what I'm not giving my team now. Or, yes, I am doing that. So it was a, just a super valuable tool for me. I know you're very humble, but it's extremely rare, as I said, for a player to even write that down, but also the self-accountability. And I know football clubs work pretty hard, but there was a transition period of change, which we'll get into as well. But to be able to look deep within yourself and go, I can, I'm doing this, I'm not doing this, that's very hard. Then put pen to paper, even when you're not a coach. What was kind of, what was just driving you? Did you just have this sense, like something obviously motivated you to write that down and it's been a game changer since? I just wanted to get into your mind. Probably the last 10 weeks of my last season probably had a big impact. Like prior to, so I started in 82, 83, and by 84, I was 
in the team every week. And then 87, 88, I was captain. And, yeah, I was all Australian, best and fairest, um, yeah, represented Victoria. So I was always getting picked every single week. Suddenly at the end of 98, I was sitting on the bench. I was struggling, playing out of form. And I remember sitting on the bench one day thinking, gee, not everyone turns up like I used to, knowing I'm going to get a game, knowing I'm going to get a list on there every year, knowing I'm going to get well paid. I think that was really critical, like that 10-week period, just to start to understand what it was like for everyone else in the team and not just look through your own lens. Mm. Um, I think that was one of the reasons that I did it was probably out of respect for all the other players in the team. Like what did they need? Not necessarily what what do your best players need, but what does everyone need within the team? I think that was a big part of it. I think the other thing was I just sensed that leadership was changing and had to change. So, and again, regardless, regardless if you've got a title, you can still be a leader and a role model, you know, whether that's at home, whether that's at work. So even though I didn't know whether I'd be a coach, I always saw myself as a leader. You know, so I thought, well, if I want to be a good leader as a dad, as a husband, you know, with my family, with Tammy leading leading the family, the two of us, whatever work I get into, this is going to be super valuable. So I think they were the reasons I, I wrote it down. I think that that's so wonderful to hear and also to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes as well. For the non-Australian listeners, I know you're humble, so you're probably not going to say anything, but, you know, just you listed some of your many awards. You're a top, top, top performing player and very naturally not to think about, you know, maybe someone who's pretty good but not amazing or someone who's in and out of the team. You wouldn't think that way because you've obviously, you know, your mindset's very differently. It's very different. So for you to kind of look all around you, I think that's probably also one of the reasons why you've become a very successful coach as well, to not just see it from your exact point of view. Very unique that way as well. Yeah, and I think as frustrating as the last 10 weeks were, they were, they were super valuable. I think maybe without those 10 weeks, if I had finished off, you know, as a really good player and then just retired, I, I may have not had that awareness. So I think mm. that was a really critical part of my journey into leadership. And from the, you know, ending up your career, you know, I've had quite a few football players on and, you know, a lot of them say that you just know when it's, when it's over did you have that feeling and can you explain it to us non-athletes what that means yeah you do i mean i think it varies from player to player as to what it feels it'd be interesting to get your view after talking to some other players but mm. i think for me it was just physically like you know when you've set a certain standard for many years and then you can't do it you know you probably can still play because and without saying arrogant because your 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 hot your top standard is so good mm. that even if you drop back to 70 80 percent but then it's about holding yourself accountable again. Do I really want to be that player? Do I really want to be the player that was 80% or 70% of the the other player? And then are the club better to put a young guy in that, that could do what I can do, but also his ceiling is going to go up. Mine's going to continue to go down. His ceiling is going to go up. So I, for me, it was an easy decision. Um, and I think making that decision then allows you to plan. If you don't make the decision and it hits you with a ton of bricks, then you're sort of lost for maybe a month, six months, a year, whatever it might look like. Because a lot of players, not necessarily that I've spoken to, but I've heard off the podcast, they've really struggled with the idea of retirement or being delisted. And that's been a mental journey. And I think there is some like um, practices the AFL has, or I'm not, you probably know better than me, maybe some help that players can get. But it seems that when there hasn't been the planning, that's when, you know, life can kind of spiral in that sense. But what I find very interesting is you've also spoken about, you know, being a selfish player and the word selfish isn't the word that everyone thinks it is, but as a player, you know, you're trying to be the best that you can, you know, use all the resources and everything to be a top performer. But then you've also, it's very rare. You want to play for as long as possible. You might love the game. You want the money. You want to be in the system, all of that stuff. But then to think about the club and go, you know, maybe a young person can take my spot. No other industry would be thinking like that. As an accountant, I'm not thinking, oh, okay, if I leave, yeah. someone else can come in. What is it about AFL or at least, you know, that system where you actually value the youth coming through at the expense of potentially yourself? I think when you're in a footy club, it's like a family. You know, you're like it's not just a job. And I think as, as frustrated as the fans get, 
And I understand it when teams do poorly. I always say this, there's, there wouldn't be one fan that's hurting more than any of the players. You know, because when you're in a football club, people ask me a lot, who do you support? It's such a different feeling when you're coaching or playing. You're all in. Like it's like it's not like you're supporting a club. You're living and breathing. Mm. So then, when you're making these decisions that you're asking about, you are taking in your family into consideration. My family is the Sydney Swans. You know, and that's why you, when you hear players get traded or delisted, they get really hurt because you're really connected to that family. To imagine getting traded out of your family. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, your brother comes up or your mum and dad tap you on the shoulder and say, look, Bruzy, yeah, we love you. You're getting a bit old, mate. We're going to – the Smiths have offered us, you know, you're 61. The Smiths have offered <laughs> 35-year-olds. Uh, like they're in the prime of their careers. Yeah, we want you to go and live with the Smiths now. Like it's a bit like that, you know. It's, yeah. And that's why I think, you know, when you, when you are at a good footy club and you are with a good bunch of people – yeah, you are thinking about those other things, not just yourself. Very interesting. And, you know, I'm kind of going off topic, but I'm very curious. When, as a coach, delisting someone, that must be one of the worst parts of the game. How do you go about that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. People ask me that all the time. And, and without going into all the technicalities, if you set really clear guidelines at an AFL club, we talk about acting your way into the system or acting your way out, it's actually easy. Because by the end of the year, you've given so much feedback to the players that really the, the exit interview is, a, is about 30 weeks of feedback just rolled up. And most of the time the players come in, they know what's coming. Now, the hardest ones are the ones that are just love the footy club, do everything right. But from a technical point of view, they're just dropping off or someone's getting above them. They're really difficult. But I tell this to people all the time. But what happens, you look them in the eye and you say, you know, Ruzi, look, mate, we're going to have to delish you, mate. We're really sorry. You know what they do? They step up, they shake, you in the, shake your hand, they look you in the eye and they say, thanks very much. I've enjoyed myself. Amazing. And they go on and become successful somewhere else because they're such high character individuals. I worked at a previous uh, volunteering organisation where I was a the manager there. And, you know, they always talked about feedback. And yeah. I, I took that down because that was one of the values, but no one, it was me and another guy. We were obsessed with feedback. Where am I? Probably too much. What am I doing well? What am I not doing well? I'm an 18 year old. So I want to, at that stage, I want to be a CEO one day and they wouldn't get there. Like, yeah, you're doing all right, mate. And I hated that. And eventually like I try and organize meetings and, you know, sometimes I get feedback, but then when they would kind of ask feedback and I give feedback, you know, the, what's the positive sandwich, you know, a good thing, a Oh, yeah. than a good thing and but they couldn't handle it and i you know look, maybe i didn't deliver it in a certain way but it really wasn't the value but for me and it's been a value since people used to make jokes before i was married with girls where if it didn't end well that they'd, they'd go uh, i'd organize a date a coffee date and be like okay where could i do better so that I can do better for the next date and that's the type of person that i was but it was so rare and so difficult for many people to have that feedback culture but i love what you're saying because feedback actually makes you better and you can thrive and i really with all my environments and relationships that is a core value so if you're going to like work with me and discuss things or in my relationship it's something i really value but a lot of people can't handle that what has been your experience with you know that side Oh, you're a hundred percent right. It's funny, Nathan Jones, who was my captain when I was coaching Melbourne, he does a few keynotes for my company, and he was asked by my business partner a really on impromptu question in a keynote that he was doing for one of our clients, and said, "Oh, Jonesy, what's the biggest difference you find between football and work?" And he just started work for a building company, I think. Nice. And impromptu, didn't know the com question was coming. Uh, Murph didn't really know what the answer was going to be. He said, "Oh, easy question to answer: feedback." You just don't get any feedback in the corporate world. And any you ask any football or any sports person that goes in the corporate world, and it, and all the workshops we do, it's it comes up constantly. But the reason is, is you should only give feedback to make people feel better. Sorry, make make people improve. There's there's no other reason to give feedback, to make people improve and to make the company better. And that's what football's all about. As brutal as the feedback I got from you know, some of my early coaches, I still knew 
that it was only given to make me better and to make the footy team better. But I've been getting feedback since I was 17. So any form, and it's a learned skill, and, and you've got to understand that. So you have to set up systems of feedback in the corporate world, but they don't do it. And it's really frustrating because there's so many great stories of sports people that have got feedback, have actioned it. And 2005, you had a young player come into my office. I said, mate, you dropped, you're, you're out of the team for this, 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 and this. And we had peer assessments where teammates would give feedback. He said, Ruzi, I want a peer assessment. I said, fantastic. I'd give him the feedback. His teammates gave him exactly the same feedback. Oh, nice. Okay, went back to the seconds, played seconds for five weeks, got back in the team, won a premiership. The ultimate success that you can have in AFL football. Without the feedback, he would never have won the premiership. So as a leader listening to this, think about how much you're holding people back. Because what happens in the corporate world, we wait for the three-month review or the six-month review, and then everyone's nervous, and then I've got to bring up stuff that happened three months ago, and you know, I thought I'd improved in that area. In a footy club, right time, right way, right place, based on KPIs, technical KPIs, and a culture code. How do we act? And it's, so it's not as... People overcomplicate feedback, but the problem is people don't have a framework for that feedback. Mm. I remember I got a call from uh, probably first month I started with Performance by Design, put the company together, and this guy rang me and said, oh, Ruzi, I just want to know what you do, and I went through it. He goes, yeah, yeah, we had a feedback session yesterday. I said, oh, okay, um, what was the feedback on? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, what... Yeah, what were the parameters um, that you're giving feedback? He goes, oh, we didn't have any. I said, how did the session go? He goes, yeah, not very well. <laughs> I said, well, what, what did you think was going to happen? So you have to be, you have to have a system, all right? We systemise our culture, we systemise our feedback, and then it just becomes what we do. Agreed. And we'll talk about performance by design and the other stuff that you do uh, to hear a little glimpse into your leadership style and capabilities. But as you said, it's a tool to improve. If you just go, you are shit at football, how does that help that person improve? And I, I really like that. And, you know, on a similar note, I do a lot of screenwriting. So I've read heaps of scripts. And obviously yeah. people are very vulnerable when they're producing material like that. And I think it still applies to the corporate world. And instead of just saying the script's great or it's not good, they're not going to improve. Most people in that space, they go, your script's great. But yeah. very few scripts are great. Very few movies are brilliant. So I think I'm doing a disservice if I just say it's brilliant. So I go, I really enjoyed it. Here are some areas that I've, you know, there, there could be areas for change or I didn't quite understand or whatever it is. But overall, it's really good. And then that's actually what helps a writer or anyone in that space really grow because a lot of people are too scared to do it. So I love that you're framing it as a way to improve. And it also applies to relationships. Me and my wife, we have like feedback sessions. Where And it's not <laughs> you're doing this wrong. It's how can we yeah. thrive together? And I think yep. that's the biggest game changer that I've had in terms of interpersonal relationships is, you know, we're here. to. It's not me against you. I want you to do well. You want yeah. me to do yeah. well. Yeah, that's, that's my rant. So I'm glad that you could put it to words. I'm also thinking, so for, for context, you were the coach of uh, Sydney Swans. You do really well. You then go to the Melbourne Football Club, and it's a very different club. They don't have a strong systems. It's not a very well-performing club. Sydney, top-performing club and still is. Credit to you. What were you thinking there when you come into that system and you kind of have to change everything? Was it overwhelming? Was it scary? What were you thinking at the time? Look, I think because Peter Jackson, who was the CEO at the time, and Glenn Bartlett, the chairman, just they spelled it out. I was under no misconceptions as to what, you know, how bad it was from those things that you mentioned. So I, I knew going into it and I knew I could never have done it had I not coached Sydney. I would say that. I, there's no way known you could have put a young coach in that environment because it was just too difficult. But having coached Sydney and understood the system – yeah, we just, we just put the same system in. It had different touch points and starting points and middle and all those sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I had to start with was you know, building good relationships because I, I didn't have relationships with the Melbourne players. But I'd already, when I started playing with the Swans, sorry, coaching the Swans, <coughs> I'd already played with the Swans players. So, yeah. so I had to orchestrate, be really intentional with our relationship building. But fundamentally... 
you know, the same process. It just took longer, obviously. Um, and probably the one thing is just it's, as silly as it sounds, I was probably more positive in my first season at Melbourne and we'd only won four games than I was in my previous eight and a half years at Sydney because I realised that these guys had, had had a really tough time. They needed to be cuddled. They needed to have someone believe in them and and teach them and, and be in the trenches with them, not, you know, me versus them. So there was some, yeah, some differences. But as I said, the experience at Sydney allowed me to put a system in place at Melbourne. And, and that included bringing coaches with me. Oh. I couldn't have done it without Matthew Matthews and Daniel McPherson, Brett Allison, Georgie Stone, yeah, and then all the staff that were there, which were great. Peter Jackson had done a great job putting staff in as well, and Glenn Bartlett. So I couldn't have done it without them either. I like that you thank everyone as well. A great leader is how what I've seen is when things aren't going well, they're able to still, you know, perform. You know, extremely high pressure job, as you said, losing. It's still you knew that you weren't going to get a lot of wins, but starting out you probably didn't realise how bad it actually was. Even though people are telling you it would have been a shock to the system, you would still feel the pressure. But to still, you know, kind of come from love, I know that could sound a bit like wanky to some people, but, you know, coddling the players, that can be really hard. You're frustrated. Why aren't they learning? I've taught them this is so basic. I've been doing this for years. Was that also something that you were quite aware of? Like even during the extremely stressful times to still show up and, you know, because that's hard. That's something you're feeling and there's visible frustration all around. How did you kind of cope with that you have to be conscious of that and the 25 points i wrote down if i hadn't if i hadn't done that that i wouldn't have been a, as good a coach at melbourne but i was talking to nathan jones the other day and this is a, a great answer to your question and jonesy and i were talking about certain things and i said i said jonesy don't you remember i think it was week three we'd lost to the giants we'd come back and you were cranky in the hallway and said rusey we're shit and I said, Jonesy, don't worry about it, mate. I've been there, done that. We'll get out of it. We'll be fine. But, yeah, there was lots of those moments where I could sense because no player goes out to lose. No go, no player goes out to play poorly. So, and, and the fact that I'd been at Fitzroy helped as well. I mean, we'd be 0 at 10 one year, I remember. We didn't get paid at times, you know. So all the trials and tribulations that I'd had at Fitzroy helped me when I was coaching Melbourne as well. So, yeah, I was really conscious and sometimes you had to bite your tongue and sometimes you had to walk out of the room or sometimes – but there was other times too where you had to be hard on the players. So it was, all, it, was, it was a balancing act also. You couldn't – so to set standards, you can't walk past certain behaviours, right? So there's a real balance between the positive and these are the standards. Well, I'm not going to compromise my standards, but I'm going to support you and if you can get there, that's, that's, that's my preference. So it's such a complex – yeah, when you're starting at a, a one out of 10, yeah, it's such a complex business to get it all right. Mm. It sounds like you've been a very quick learner, you know, from the foot, from the playing days to the coaching days and all the learnings there that, you, that you're able to kind of see and experience, whether it was good or inverted commas bad, and then learn from that experience. Is that something you're also mindful of? Yeah, I got asked a question the other day, actually. Someone said, oh, so I didn't, didn't know a heap about footy and said, oh, Rizzy, what type of player were you? What, what made you, you know, seven-time All-Australia, whatever it was? I said, and I thought, I think my self-awareness. I, was always, I always knew what I was good at athletically and, yeah, mentally. And, and I think learning, you know, I was always pretty quick to pick things up. You know, I was, I was good at tennis, I was good at basketball, mm. you know, and I was able to sort of sum up person. So in answer I think so. I think I was always able to pick up concepts pretty quickly um, and find solutions pretty quickly, and that definitely translated into my, my coaching career at Sydney and Melbourne. And the, this resilient mindset as well, to be able to play 350 games, I don't know how little amount of people have done that. That is extremely 350 plus, actually. You would have had this additional resilience. How are you when there were injuries? Maybe the media is talking about you. You're not performing to your best. Was that something you're able to not let the external noise impact you as much? What was kind of the relationship there? Yeah, I mean, you had to really. You know, sometimes the criticism hurt. There's no question. But I think, I think what footy teaches you and sport teaches you, you have to show up. Like, there's, you can't. Like, if I don't turn up and I'm captain of Fitzroy on a Saturday at 2.10, 
everyone knows I'm not there. Mm. <laughs> like, whereas in the corporate world, you don't you don't have to show up. Yeah. You know, you had a bad day on a Thursday, you can stay home on the Friday. You can't do that in sport. You have to turn up to training. You have to turn up as a coach to the press conference. You have to turn up to the best and fairest, to jump, whatever it is. You have to turn up to the members' function, the sponsors' function. So I think, to me, that's resilience, is just showing up. Just show up when you don't feel like showing up. And that was certainly, I learned a lot of that through my time playing and coaching. And brought it into the coaching as well. And from the injury side, you all players get a lot of injuries. You may have not had as many severe injuries as the average player, but you would still would have had to play through pain and maybe lack of motivation as well. How, what was what was that guiding light? What pushed you through to you know, finish the games? Probably a couple of things. Probably the fact that we we didn't really have full access to doctors and physios. Then we did have a doctor and a physio. So yeah. and we worked. So I would say. Anyone that played, you know, 300, 350 games, Michael Tuck, 400, Kevin Bartlett. Like, I remember times where you get an injury on a Thursday night and all you did was ice when you got home and thought, oh, that calf's a bit sore or, yeah, but I have to go to work tomorrow. So, I mean, I'm going to play. So it's not like I'm not going to play because I haven't even seen the doctor. I can't see the doctor tomorrow. I might duck into the physio if I can in lower plenty and see Rod Lincoln and and duck in and but there was never any question that you weren't going to play like it was just so it's just a different I don't want to say it's a different mindset because it was just a different environment yeah. I, I rolled ankle prior to the preliminary final in 1986 really bad on the Thursday night had to go off the training track turned up at Baldwin Garth Dicker I think Rod Lincoln were there put me through a, you know gave me an injection Saturday morning before the game. Oh. Yeah, we can strap it up. We can play again. So I don't want to sound like yeah, an old player talking about, but I'm I'm just trying to set more the environment rather than you know I don't want to sound like we were tougher. The environment we probably just, were. Yeah, well maybe we were, but the environment was different because, for instance, yeah, you know, what would happen now in that instance? Yeah, you know, roll the ankle. Right, I can turn up tomorrow morning and get an MRI. Oh, you've got you know. A, a grade whatever that's going to be two or three weeks you can't play it so again i'm just trying to explain the different environment you know there just wasn't the mri there just wasn't the turn up in the morning to see the doctor the doctor was working full-time somewhere else and so was the physio so then you had to make an internal decision were you going to play and 99 percent of the time yeah unless it was something you know broke major in a state game and yeah you know, tore my groin yeah you know, things like that you know, you would, you would pretty, I mean, you know, all the players back then could tell you hundreds and hundreds of stories about teammates or themselves playing games where potentially they had an injury, but they didn't even really know what the injury was. Sometimes that could actually work in your favour. I believe I heard a story of a player that injured his leg or his knee and he didn't want to know how bad it was because he wanted to play in the preliminary finals. And he's like, do not tell me. I don't know if that would work now. And he found out afterwards how bad it was, but he was so proud that he played. I'm not necessarily recommending anything, but I also think what, you know, kind of coming from the kinesiology side and the meditation side is that if you've got this resilience and this belief, you might potentially be able to heal yourself quicker. You're not as focused. You know how resilient your body is and you're able to move forward. Did you, do you wonder if that kind of like played a factor as well? Cause now we're very, and I, I have no, um, attachment to either side you know if someone gets a little bit injured whether it's nba you're off for the week so i'm wondering if the system that you developed in your mind kind of helped you move forward within your body much quicker than the average person as well yeah i honestly believe yeah you know, your mind has a significant impact on how quickly you heal you know there's no question about that you know yeah. the positive mindset you know you can tell yourself that i'm injured you know, you can tell yourself you're going to miss three weeks or four weeks. And we've all heard stories about that where people have been told, you know, this or that or the other thing and, and they've come back to the day of what they've been told. Mm. You know, we've, all, we've also heard stories about people that have been told we're going to be out six weeks and 10 days later they're back playing, you know, because they haven't accepted that narrative. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting you go against the narrative, but I'm suggesting, you know, we are way more powerful than we think we are. There's okay. no question about that. 
Agreed. I remember, I don't remember, so people can fact check me, but essentially, I think there was a study where doctors told a certain amount of clients how long they would have to live. And let's just say they said 10 months and it was within two weeks of that. And it's the power of the mind, which is crazy. And, you know, people could maybe argue the doctor just knows because they've seen a lot, but I, I disagree. I think it's the power of. I think the one, the other one, which is fascinating is when, you know, the husband or the wife dies, you know, it, you know, when we're talking dying at, you know, 80, 81, 82, yeah. how many times have we heard the perfectly healthy, you know, um, partner that's married dies within six months or 10 months or something like that, mm. you know, and that's that will to live, you know, and, and the, obviously the, the heartbreak of your partner of 50 years, 60 years passing away. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's real. I think your mind plays a significant part in, in everything we do. Agreed. I'm, I'm glad that we, you know, could figure out life secrets as well. But you also mentioned purpose. You know, there's a huge purpose when you're playing football, you know, when you're coaching. I know you're doing various leadership things now. What is kind of your purpose now? What is your why? What drives you? What gets you out of bed? Yeah, really family. I mean, I, family and striving. I think that's the big thing for me. My purpose is, yeah, using the 40 years I've had of experience and trying to fast track, you know, give that knowledge and fast track other people because nice. I was fortunate to be in a great environment, you know, and family's number one and then, you know, teaching is probably number two now in, in what my purpose is in life. You know, it's very interesting. I know you've always been family orientated, but I know you hate work-life balance and I want to hear why. But the <laughs> idea, like when you're a football player, this is the only thing that matters. And I, do you think you would be surprised if you could tell yourself now that you would be more family orientated and like football is not everything and that there's more to life than just, you know, the one thing? I think I was lucky to meet Tammy as a, as a Californian because what that did was allowed me to go overseas every year and no one cared about Australian rules football. And I'm like, it's so big in Australia. I think that gave me perspective of... And as you said before, there's this this self selfishness as an AFL player, but then then there has to be a perspective about what you're actually really doing. I was fortunate to play Australian rules football. I was a kid that started the Beverly Hills Footy Club at yeah I don't know eight or nine. I'm playing footy for a living. Like, can you believe? Now I worked I worked most of the time up until probably mid nineties. But the reality is, I think I always had that ability to put that into perspective that. You know, we, we are just playing football. Now, I know, you know, and it's incredibly important when you're doing it. It's incredibly important to everyone's lives and fans, and you realise that. But there also has to be part of you that says, you know, we're not curing cancer. We're not. I went and spoke at a, um, uh, which hospital was it? And they were all emergency doctors and, you know, intensive care doctors. And I, I think I started by going, guys, I feel embarrassed standing here. I'm a coach and an ex-player. You guys are literally saving lives. All I did was kick a footy around and then coach a bunch of guys that kick the footy around. So I think if you've got that ability to put it in perspective, you know, then it does help with your balance in life. True. But it is your world, your worldview, you're in it. It's still yeah. hard to go. And we all are important in our own journeys. It could still be very hard to, you know, have a different perspective because it's our life. We're in it as well. So I like that. Oh, and when, yeah, and when the media is telling you how bad you are or how good you are and the CEO of the AFL is telling you you're never going to win a premiership, yeah, it, it's it's serious stuff, you know, and you're getting letters from fans and, you know, all those sorts of things. And then you see the reaction in 2005 when you win a premiership, the reaction of, you know, the South Melbourne, Sydney supporters. I mean, it is huge. I mean, AFL football, you know, is – I went down for the grand final this year, you know, left Hawaii and – and it just reminded me again, you know, spending a week in Melbourne for grand final week and going to the grand final. Again, it just reminds you of how big the sport is in particularly in the, the southern states. You you probably should have stayed in Hawaii given your team got destroyed, but maybe we'll talk about that later. But I'm glad you could uh, enjoy the whole experience. You mentioned uh, the CEO, I think it was Andrew Demetri at the time. And I think this is a great story of resilience and actually walking the talk. For those that don't know, the CEO came out and criticized your coaching and said you'll never win games or win a flag with your style. That would be very challenging to hear when kind of the lead person is criticizing you. You might have a bit of doubts. 
there's probably a lot of stuff going on internally. It might shake or sh- your confidence, but you didn't change after that comment. Can you tell me a little bit what was going on at the time? Yeah, it was pretty bizarre. Like the, the way I, I sort of look back on it, I think, imagine, imagine if the CEO of Coca-Cola said something like, look, I wouldn't drink Coca-Cola in Sydney. I, I'd probably drink pe- Pepsi if I was you. <laughs> yeah, we were, the only, we were the only team in New South Wales competing against rugby league and rugby union. Mm-hmm. So think about it. You've got the CEO of the AFL with their one team in Sydney telling people effectively, well, I wouldn't be watching the Swans play because they can't win. It was a really bizarre comment and a, a real lack of leadership. It probably taught me a lot more positives and negatives and also a lack of leadership from the commission where they didn't come out and say, look, we don't support what Andrew said. We've reached out to Miles Barron Hay and Paul Ruse. It's unacceptable. They're doing a great job. You know, Ruse, we spoke to Ruse and Ruse acknowledges they're not playing great footy um, and they're going to have some you know, mechanisms in place to do that. We, you talk about leadership, that's just weak leadership, you know, weak leadership. So a terrible, so sorry, and terrible marketing as well. <laughs> oh, horrendous marketing. Like, yeah. That's again, but the other thing I sort of thought to myself, well, I know I can't run the AFL and he can't coach Sydney. So they were the, they were the sort of things that were going through my head. It's just, it was just a bizarre thing to say. Um, but we handled it, you know, this is a good example though. We, yeah, living in Sydney, I think that week I was on the biggest sports radio station in Sydney. And the first question was, Rusey, what did he mean by ugly football? Because you've got to understand, you know, Sydney is a rugby league state. Mm. Hard, tough. Tony Lockett comes. Barry Hall's playing. Tough physical players. They love physicality. So they didn't even really, they didn't even really know what the CEO was talking about, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but look, as it turned out, yeah, didn't worry us too much. There was times when we used it to our advantage. Uh, did it have a bearing on us winning the premiership? Yeah, maybe slightly, but that's all you need. Um, and then oh, we won the same the same year that he said we couldn't win a game or we couldn't win a premiership doing what we're doing. So, you know, it's very interesting about you. You, uh, the average person would be like, "Fuck him, can't believe this." And maybe you did behind closed doors, but you've been very supportive in that space. Where here's what I learnt. It was bad leadership. I learned from that bad experience. And I think that's a winning mindset in life where an experience has happened. It's probably the most overwhelmed you've probably felt in a long time, having that many people hear it. All of the things that we've spoken about and to use that experience as a driving force, but not in like, I'm going to show him, I'm going to kill him, more in like a loving way. And, you know, you end up winning the flag. So, you know, you, you proved him wrong in that sense. Very v- rare. And I, I, I love that. It's not about this person's done that. You don't, There's no victim mentality with you. It's just kind of like moving forward mentality as well. So it's very impressive. Yeah, I think, I think I'm sure there was people that expected me on grand final day to come out and say something. I had a really nice message from one of my old teammates. And I, and I could, it was more the tone of the message because the message was fantastic. He goes, Rusey, mate, fantastic, mate. You're so humble. Your speech was so humble. And I think... I think what he meant to say was, mate, I thought you were just going to give it to Demetria like you wouldn't believe sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm sure there was people there and probably some Swans people that, that hoped I was going to do it, but I, it never entered my mind. It never, it nice. was never a thought that entered my mind. Um, and I'm, you know, it, it just was what it was really. But that also goes into a winning mindset. That experience happened. You know, you felt it. You experienced it. You learned from it, and you move on. You didn't let it hinder you and like attach to you. But why not change in that moment? Why not? You know, okay, there's something going wrong. Was it? You know, your team around you believed in you. You believed in you. What What kept you going to not? You know, make a drastic change. Probably a couple of things. I'd, I'd seen coaches change significantly based on media, based on external noise, and they seem to always get the sack. You know, they, they seem to succumb to outside pressure. So that was one. But I generally just believe we weren't playing well because we had, we'd already had a body of evidence. We played in the preliminary final in 2003. Yep. You know, at the start of 2003, we were actually pit- tipped to finish on the bottom of the ladder by 14 wow. of 16 age journalists, and we played in the preliminary final. So we'd already had a body of evidence that if we played the way we knew we could play, that we could beat the best teams in the competition. So there was probably those two things. 
And from the media side, you know, there's always a love-hate relationship. I think you've had a better relationship than the average person, you know, as a coach or a player, the media in that space, it's a small industry. They're designed to, you know, get a lot of eyeballs on whatever they whatever they're producing and, you know, they can attack a lot of players. Not everything's necessarily justified. You then, after your coaching career, you you enter into the media. What was kind of the relationship there? Because, you know, you've been on the other side. Did that impact your media journey? I think I had an understanding of the media. Before I, I got the point of coach of Sydney, I went and met an old mentor of mine who was in the media and he made an interesting comment to me. And I think that was pivotal in me understanding the media. He said, Rusey... I write stuff from my articles. He said, the next day I've completely forgotten what I've written. I don't even believe it. And I think <laughs> wow. what I realised, yeah, it was an amazing comment. And what I realised wow. from that comment is media is entertainment. And this is, this, this is probably the biggest problem for the fans, that the fans aren't being educated on the game. So that, that's a really sad thing for me. So what I, when I went into the media, I sort of thought, well, I'll under, I understand, but I want to try and educate. I want to try and actually bring people and give them exactly what is going on, you know. But but I don't know why, because I've had some discussions with this with key people. I don't know why there's not a, a burning desire for the media to really give the true um, true self of what AFL footy is. I think they're just happy for, you know, having a media person get nine things wrong and one thing right, you know, which is complete. I've said this to people before. Think about coaching. Coaching is if there's 10 things to do, you're probably going to have to get eight or nine right. In the media, you can get promoted for getting nine of those 10 things wrong as long as you get one really big thing right and it's really loud and so it doesn't really matter. So there's... There's even this opposing force of accuracy versus emotion and inaccuracy. So as long as you understand it, it doesn't make it any easier when you're coaching a bottom team, as in Melbourne, but at least you have an understanding of the industry. And I think working in it helped me understand when I went back to Melbourne, you know, that that's just the way the media is. And it, we won't get into politics whatsoever, but, you know, it's not just football, it's the world where you write people just on all sides write absolute crap, clickbait, but it's kind of we as the people can change that as well. We can demand more accountability, not actual, not absolute crap, because I think those environments believe that's what's going to sell. But I'd argue like for what you're saying as well, people want to, you know, get to know the game, understand it and, you know, Luke Hodge just springs to mind whenever I listen to him when I'm watching footy and hearing his insights. That's I like that way more than listening to trade radio and they're just making up stories for hype. And also that has consequences on the players. What, I'm being traded? Is this happening? Is this true? They're, they're not happy with me? All of that stuff. I um, <laughs> Without having too many solutions, that's actually you know how we can change the world because we have such crap and that rules our entire way of being with just made up stuff it's not the way to go so i i challenge myself and everyone to you know demand don't read the crap if you see a crap headline don't read it and hopefully we'll change the world well I, it's funny you should say that because living in hawaii right now and i've and i'm not going to get into the politics other than mention the two candidates so i thought the last two nights i thought well i'll actually look at some of the channels and i'll see what the coverage is it is garbage yeah, it is so bad. Ab- Absolute garbage. And I'm sitting there thinking, as an Australian that's come to America that sort of has a helicopter view of America, is this the best you can do on co- on the coverage of, of the election, the United States of America election? Yeah. I, I, I was so underwhelmed at how bad the coverage was. And I think if you go back 20 years ago, and I know I spoke, I've spoken to an Australian rules journalist about this, and they're, they're even frustrated themselves. You know, who's been in the industry for 30 something years. He said, Rosie, we're as frustrated as you are. We're not allowed to do deep dives into anything anymore. You know, we, we're just told to make headlines and stuff like that. And, and that's why podcasts like, um, was it Joe Rogan? You know, yeah. now has got, yeah, because the, the media have allowed this other entity to take over because no one trusts, 
you know, the information they're getting anymore. You know, I did an AF, the AFL di- daily AFL podcast, which I love doing. You know, it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes every day. And I just got a text actually literally two days ago. Ruzi, congratulations. Congratulations to all the staff. Um, you've jumped into the top 200, um, you know, and, and in in a short space of time, which haven't we haven't had anyone do that before. And I nice. think this is the frustrating thing, which you're saying as well. People want information. They want to hear Luke Hodge explain something in greater detail. They don't want to hear this garbage, you know, that's that's criticising or, you know, why are they trading him or why didn't they do that or whatever. I think there's a huge opening in the media for a new form of communication. And, it, I agree. and it's coming through podcasts. I agree. And that's why I love podcasts. And whether people like him or not, Joe Rogan as an example exploring of then there's plenty of other podcasts as well like that but it's the exploring of ideas whether you agree with the ideas or not there's a long form long format of let's at least hear where you're coming from might not agree with it but that's certainly an interesting perspective and someone like me i don't buy into the the left or the right or any of that i just want to explore the ideas and i think think that's a a difference mate because i remember as a as a kid or even 19, 20, 21 growing up. And if you saw a current affair or 60 minutes, you'd always get the two sides. Mm. You'd always get, yeah, if you looked at the analogy now, you'd always get Kamala Harris and Donald Trump on the same program talking about issues. Now you just don't get a balanced view. And again, I'm the same as you, left or right. I I don't really care. Just let's just talk about what's right and what's wrong rather than what's left and what's right. Exactly. But you're right. You just don't get a balanced view now. So you've got to navigate and work out, okay, I'm going to have to watch that and then I completely flick it over. And then the same issue is is spoken about completely different without any balance. So it's tough now if you're just watching news and trying to make informed decisions through that market. Agreed. And, you know, they're pioneers in this space, whether it's politics or health or whatever it is, and, you know, a little bit extra research, but you find the people that are very accountable as well. But, you know, going back for your media journey. So actually on that example, I had a friend who he wrote, I forget where who, who he wrote for, but he was told just make up EPL news. So he wrote an article and he said, this is what made him leave. He had to say Ronaldo was maybe, you know, the peak Cristiano Ronaldo his peak was going to come to an A-League team. And he left. He's like, I can't be part of yeah. something like that. It, it's horrible. But now you're in yeah. the media. You have an understanding that, you know, it's not necessarily in alignment with your values. How do you kind of navigate that space where you can still be you, you know, have a job and all the above as well? Yeah, I think sometimes you've got to put it in perspective about what you're trying to do. So, you know, I, I tried to give information in a difficult environment. Um, and then... You know, you've got to work out, yeah, it's still fun. I mean, it, it's he's talking about purpose. You know, the ability to go to a footy game and, and watch a game and get paid for it, you know, to get on a, a show. So, yeah, that's where the balance comes in, you know, because we're all going to be challenged around our values, you know, our value set. So trying to stick as close to them as you possibly can, you know, get as much out of that experience as you possibly can and also put it into perspective. But we're all going to be faced with times where – you know, does your value set align with that organisation? And if not, you know, you may have to leave, um, whatever, whatever that whatever that is. And, and I think that's probably what happened with me at Fitzroy at the end of 1994. You know, like I was captain of the footy club. I wanted to be a one-team player. You know, the club was just crumbling around. It was really difficult. At the end of the day, I think it just came back down to my value set and say, well, I just can't stay anymore. This is not the club that I signed up to in 1980, 81 with Bernie Quinlan and Gary Wilson and Matty Rendell and Scotty Clayton and then, you know, Alistair Lynch and Johnny Blakey and, like, all those players had left and it was just a a shell of the club that it used to be. So we're all going to be faced with those situations at certain stages in our lives. It also takes courage to do that and just to build a a bigger picture as well. The club, massive financial strengths. And I believe some players weren't being paid on time. I think, as you said, the standards weren't that great. Your your friends have left. Still, you know, a one-player club is very rare, and that's what drives a lot of players. The courage to go, you know, this is no longer quite the club that I once, you know, was once in. 
the courage to actually leave that. That's pretty phenomenal. A lot of people would have just, just, oh, this is it. It's scared to move to Sydney. It's, it's scary. What actually pushed you to do that? Because you still could have done it. It just wouldn't have been, you know, it's blossoming. Yeah, it was a hard decision. You're right, it's a hard decision. And 31 too, not knowing how long you're going to play for, to go to a new club and start a career at 31. But there was a, probably an incident that just pushed me over the edge when I when I, I won the Best and Fairest in 94 and I got up on stage and uh, the person handing it to me said, look, you're going to have to give the medal back. We haven't got a medal for you tonight. And I'm like, oh, okay. So they gave me a, a fake medal. I handed it back. Um, and then I... I sort of made the decision to go and I got a phone call and there was always fantastic supporters, well-meaning supporters. I got a phone call. I can't remember the guy's name. He said, Rusey, things are going to change. I said, okay. He said, I said, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go and come and have a coffee with you. Went to Mitchum, had a coffee, listened to him. I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll reconsider if you can do two things. You're saying we're going to get better financially. My payment is due in December. If you think we're going to get better financially, if you can bring that payment forward, that'll be a, a goodwill sign. Bearing in mind, I was captain of the club and I was best and fairest winner, so it wasn't like I was asking for a charity handout. I, I had agree, a it's good, your way. I had a pretty good reason. But I thought, well, here's a good way to test this. And then I said, look, the other thing I want you to do is get my best and fairest medal. Um, he goes, oh, no problems. I'll, I'll do both those things. About a week later, he rang me up. And you know when someone pauses on the end of the phone? Yeah. yeah. G'day, Ruby, how are you? Oh, look, I haven't been able to, we can't get your money and we can't get your best and fairest medal. Wow. So I think, I think getting all the information, controlling what you can control, and then working out who you are. I, I talk a lot about personal brand. You know, it's a really good um, exercise to do. You know, who are you? What do you stand for? You know, what, how do people see you? You know, because everyone's got a personal brand. You know, people, every interaction you have with people is going to say, well, that person is X, Y, or Z. You know, again, it's an exercise we did in the online program. You know, here's your personal brand. And even if I asked you right now, people that you'd never met in your life, tell me Roger Federer, Federer's personal personal brand. You could give me an answer. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. tell me no, doc, tell me Michael Jordan's personal brand. N- not even based on knowing them, but based on their behaviours, you can actually tell me what what you think their brand would be. Mm-hmm. You know, equally. Nick Kurios is going to have a different personal brand to, to Roger Federer. But we all have a personal brand based on our behaviours. And we're all going to be faced with these difficult decisions at times, whether we stick to those values or whether we abandon them for something else. You're a high integrity person because a lot of people, first of all, huge kudos to you for sticking up for yourself. That's really hard. Captain at the club, you love it. And they you put it to them. You did. You didn't need the heart. You asked like beyond the below uh, bare minimum, like so, and they couldn't deliver. And so, you know, you put it to them, you gave them the opportunity, then you had the courage to actually commit because I challenged and, you know, I challenged a lot of people that might not even be able to do that. And so I think that's really impressive. 31 is also really scary in terms of football age because a lot of careers ended well before then as well. So that's, that's great. When were you, did you ever think about legacy, like as a player, as a coach? Was that something that was important to you? I think you're always thinking about it without thinking about it. Does that make sense? Yes. It comes back to who you are and your personal values. Um, and I think because of my role models that I'd mentioned before, you know, I think because they were just good people, I thought, well, if, if you're a good person and do good things and have good behaviours and have good values, you're probably going to leave a good legacy. Um, but it was interesting when I went to the Sydney Swans Hall of Fame just recently and it hit home. It keeps hitting home legacy more and more. And, and it was um, Kieran Jack, Jared McVeigh, Nick Smith and Heath Grundy who I'd either played with or coached, you know, um, during my time at Sydney Swans. And they did, they, got, they all got inducted in the Hall of Fame. And Every one of them spoke about legacy, the legacy they got, you know, from the, the leaders, that, and they felt like they had to leave the place in better shape. Yeah, so oh, that wow. really hit home again that I think it's a really good way to hold yourself accountable. What's the legacy you want to leave this organisation? Yeah, you know, what's the legacy you want to leave your family? Yeah, you know, one of the proudest things, my dad passed away like seven years ago, eight years ago, whenever it was, and every single person I ran into after had the same thing. Geez, your dad was a good guy. Gee, he was fair. And when you when you hear that, 
you start to think about, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, like they, everyone said the same thing. So what that told me that his behaviour was consistent, no matter whether he was under pressure at work, at the tennis club, at a working bee, what it, everyone said the same thing. Geez, I met your dad, David. I worked with him. Oh, great. Geez, he was a nice guy. Geez, he was fair. Geez, he was friendly. That's legacy. But we probably need to spend more time thinking about it. I agree. And it's something you, you speak to, and I try to apply this in my life, where people remember how you made them feel, not necessarily what, yeah. you, what you did. I think that's really important. It's a really nice quote. Yeah. It's a great quote, isn't it? It's a great quote. Uh, before we go and do a rapid fire segment, we've spoken about it as well, but you've got a few business ventures and you, obviously the listener can tell how passionate you are about leadership. You have performance by design. I think you also work with your your son, Prince the King program. Can you tell me a bit about both of them and why you do it? Yeah, so performance by design is a leadership program, um, a leadership company on culture that we started about seven, eight years ago. So really, you know, based on the, the lessons I learned at Sydney, you know, defining who you are, building really strong relationships um, and having really honest conversations and trying to systemize culture. What we talk about performance by design is how do we take the chance out of culture, which is a really, you know, we, so I'm really passionate about it. We've got some great clients, which I really love. And then I've also been helping with my son, Dylan, who does a club program called Prince the King and mentors sort of 14 to 22 year olds. Yeah. We were also putting an online program together, the PBD ruse, um, academy online academy cool. so combining all my learnings yeah because people are a bit time poor and you know we're, we're doing that as well so yeah look i'm really passionate about as i said i think i've been really fortunate because no one's teaching leadership no one teaches it you don't learn leadership at school you don't learn leadership at college you don't learn leadership at you at, at in the corporate space so why don't we start teaching it and then hopefully fast tracking the next generation of leaders because we are desperate for good leaders, absolutely desperate for good leaders. I agree 100%. And those will be in the episode notes below so people can check them out, check them out as well. Just we'll have to do this as a part two, but I studied accounting and management at Monash and what a joke management was. There was <laughs> not even a, a second of this is how you become a good leader. It was just the theory behind it. And people get degrees in this. And this is, and I don't say this to be a uh, egotistical monster. This is like the top university in our state. And it's the audacity to give me a management degree. Uh, ridiculous. But I am um, quite a funny story. So it's a lot of the coaches go and do the Harvard leadership or business course, which is a, you know, and I remember, and I won't mention the name, but I remember one of the coaches come back and was interviewed and, and, you know, what did you learn from the Harvard um, Business School? He goes, oh, you know, I, I probably just need to build stronger relationships. So I remember turning turn to one of my mates at the time. I said, mate, he could have, I could have gone out a coffee with him. He could have given me 10 grand instead of paying 100 grand to Harvard. We could have had a coffee down at Albert Park. I could have told him that. Yeah. So, you know, like I think, again, without being critical, because I'm all for PD and all for learning, you know, I think sometimes we overcomplicate things as well, you know, and what we try and do at Performance by Design and what Dylan and I try to do with it is, is keep it really simple, you know, simple philosophies, actionable philosophies. And if we can do that, then people are going to learn way quicker than as what you said, like doing an accounting and management course where you don't learn anything about management. Yeah, exactly. And who are the type of people that would be interested? Is um, Performance by Design more corporates and, the one, and Prince the King's more younger people, older people? What's the... Yeah, the Prince the King was designed because Dylan had a really good upbringing, obviously, but but I think what he was fortunate, you know, not only had mum and dad, but he also had the footy club. And so what he realised was, you know, that having really good mentors around you is really important then because there's a stage where kids stop listening to you, about 13, 14 or 15. So when mm -hmm. he came to the idea and it was his idea, his business, um, it really is just you know, when the when the boys start stop listening to the parents, you know, whatever age that is, yeah. that's okay. It happened to me and Tammy. It doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It just means you need some help. I was lucky to get some help. Yeah, you know, I could go to Stewie Maxfield and say, Stewie, can you go and tell Dylan and Tyler X, Y, Z? I'm, I'm, I just told them the same thing the next day, the day before. But yeah. a lot of parents don't have that. So it's a really, really good program, you know, for, for probably 14 to 22-year-olds roughly. And then Performance by design is really for anyone that's got a company, anyone that's got people, you know, anyone that wants to, to further their development from a team and individual point of view. 
Amazing. And we're going to do a very quick rapid fire segment. So the first thing that springs to mind, I won't comment on them. What did winning father of the year mean to you? I was really proud. I mean, because it's a hard job and being a parent and it's a hard job being a uh, coach of the Sydney Swans. Like, like just an enormous sense of pride. When you think of your premiership medal, what are the emotions that spring to mind? I think how important it was to so many people and how much effort so many people put in. They're, they're, they're the main things I reflect on. Three traits you look for in a leader and one trait you can't stand. Uh, I would say communication, honesty, and empowerment. Uh, I'm going to say lack of self-awareness. Favourite player to coach? I've been into <laughs> trouble. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer it differently because I've been asked that a lot. That coaching is about putting players in a position that they're capable of performing. And I let Leo Barry down. I put him in a position that he should never have been able to perform in. He's a 184 centimetre... 84 kilo fullback, and he was unbelievable. So I, I would say more from the point of view of Leo, thank you for making me look better because I should never have played you at fullback. And you, yeah, you showed me that you were able to do it. Great answer. And any advice you want to give to people who want to try something different on you, but perhaps a bit fearful of doing so? Yeah, I think this notion of failure. Again, sometimes the English language doesn't do justice to words. Failure should be learning. Yeah, did you did you fail? No, no, I learned. Oh, okay, no, I, have you ever failed at anything? No, no, I learned. I think we just got to change the narrative. If we said to someone, if someone said, "Look, I, I don't want to, you know, learn how to play a musical instrument because I don't want to fail," you know, well, you don't want to learn. No, no, I don't want to fail. Hang on, I, I'm not. That's what I'm asking you. You know, what do you want to learn? So I think. I think if we change the narrative around some of the words we use, then we have a different perspective and then we can go forward a lot faster. Agreed. You can be a co-host on this podcast. Well said. And before we go, how can people follow you and keep up to date with you? Yeah, look, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I think that's a good platform for me. So just follow me on LinkedIn. I'm going to be a bit more active probably on Instagram and Facebook and just get a bit more, probably a bit more vocal on leadership um, because I get asked around it a lot, but I'm like most 61 year olds, I'm not really good at IT and all this new stuff that's got, but I'm going to have a, a help and my son's going to help me do that. So look, reach out, probably LinkedIn at the moment is the best platform to do that. And I always love talking about leadership. Great. That, everything that we've spoken about that you're involved in will be in the episode notes below. Thank you so much. You're very inspiring, empowering and all the leadership attributes that you've spoken about, you actually embody it. This was a real joy. And yeah, thank you so much for chatting with me. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it. I love how Paul talks about feedback. Feedback isn't simply about whether this is what you've done right or wrong. It is about helping others improve and building a cohesive system around you. Feedback, if implemented correctly, can vastly change your life for the better. Put your ego to the side, listen to your intuition, and you'll know the right way forward. So I'll leave you with this epic quote. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. Ken Blankhart. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 